So I'm an economist, but not a macroeconomist. And when model projections came in about the consequences of the Brexit, I was possibly just as confused as anyone else. And I wanted to learn how to understand these numbers. Let me tell you what I learned. These numbers come from comparing two scenarios in an economic model. What do we mean with this? So you can use an economic, economic model to sort of simulate forward what you think will happen with GDP in time, depending on certain assumptions. More to that later. And if you change assumptions, you may get slightly different paths for that GDP. And the difference between the GDP in some period, hence, say, 20 years time, say 6% difference, these are the sort of numbers that are being reported. So some will say that you know, we are better off if we stay in the EU. Others will have models where they predict that um, staying in the EU will actually deliver a slower growth rate. So what is a model? Let's imagine a box. Now a model isn't a black box. That would be a really, really bad model. But importantly, we need some inputs for that model. Then inside the model, there will be some sort of mechanics happening. Now, being economists, we usually express these mechanics in terms of differential equations or difference equations. Uh, but that's not really important here, but we, we do like our maths and that helps us uh, doing the modeling. Now, importantly, also, there are some important choices we need to make in that model. For instance, are all cars a beetle? Or do we have different types of cars? And it turns out that this particular aspect uh, actually turns out to be important. Now, then we need inputs into that model that may, for instance, be tariffs. So there may be high or low tariffs. And then depending on these mechanics and the particular inputs into the model which we choose, we will get these paths of GDP development over the next however many years we are interested in. And if we change the tariffs, for instance, increase them, we may get a different sort of outcome. Now, of course, these outcomes aren't for certain. And if we're good economists, we need to vary these outcomes to see how sensitive our outcome is, depending on what particular inputs we choose. So different economists come up with different predictions about the impact of Brexit on GDP. The LSE says the impact will be a negative effect between 6 and 8%. Patrick Minford says it will be a positive effect, 4%. Then we have models by the Treasury predicting a negative effect in a certain range between 3 and 9, and the OECD a negative effect in range from 2 to 7. Now, the top two are models which concentrate on trade, and the bottom two models are really quite big economic models. So let's concentrate on the top two models and let us explain what's happening here. So we're modeling trade between the UK, Europe and the rest of the world. And the situation is that currently there are no tariffs between the UK and Europe. Now, cars here in this model are Beatles and Jaguars, different cars, that's important. Now, the Brexit would imply that there will now be tariffs between the UK and Europe, although they may be smaller than tariffs between the UK and the rest of the world. So in contrast to the LSE model, Patrick Minford concludes that there is a positive effect of Brexit. An important factor in this is that he assumes that all cars are Beatles, not necessarily Beatles, but are one type of car rather than the existing differentiated cars. Now, he also assumes, if I see that right, that there will be continued tariff-free access to the single market. Also, he assumes that the UK actually drops all import tariffs and the, the gains come through the removal of these trade barriers. Now, that comes at the cost of weakening local manufacturing and agricultural sectors. And it's going to be the service sector that picks this up. In the context of this, it's important to uh, stress that Patrick Minford also assumes that leaving the European Union will not have any adverse effect on trade in services. Certainly something that could be disputed.
Now it's important to understand whether these gains here come from the removal of the trade barriers or the different model setup. It actually turns out that the previously discussed LSE model also attempted to model the case where the UK drops all import, tra all import tariffs. But even if the LSE models that, they come to the conclusion that Brexit will have a negative impact. So the different outcomes are mainly due to the different mechanics working in the model. For instance, the, the issue of whether products are differentiated as in the LSE case and therefore trades naturally in cars, for instance, naturally spreads over different countries or whether we have a uniform product like only beetles, in which case everyone will buy that one car from the cheapest supplier. And that is what is being assumed in the Minfoot model. So different mechanics, different assumptions, different results. So you may quite rightly ask who is right. As you decide which assumptions to use, you have to think very carefully, for instance here, what sort of trade deals are likely to arise after Brexit with Europe, with China, with the US. You also need to ask what would happen if we stayed in the EU. So economic models are driven by these assumptions and by the mechanics, but of course we don't know for sure. However, that doesn't mean that anything goes. You need to think carefully, is it realistic to get a free trade deal without free movement of labor? Now, the question of Brexit is not only an economic question. Other issues play in like foreign investment, control over laws, rules and regulations, immigration. The issue of productivity and foreign investment is usually dealt with with these big economic models. But what about rules and regulations? Leaf campaigners, for instance, argue that environmental rules imposed by the EU cost about 2% of GDP. That comes from some UKIP paper, this claim. Also, that rules that evolve around social laws, like that there's paternity and maternity leave, cost about 2.5% of GDP. And other rules like food safety rules and other product and substances rules cost about 1% of GDP. Now, it's not so clear where all these numbers come from, but even if you take these numbers for face value, if you say these rules and regulations are costly to the economy, you got to ask yourself, how much regulation do you want? You can save all of these costs if you get rid of all regulation, perhaps, but do you want to live in a world without regulation? So what about the Remain campaign? Are their arguments better? Do they stack up? Now, we talked about the economic models before that argue that Brexit is costly. But if you go to the website of the Britain Stronger in Europe campaign, you see claims like these. Almost half of everything the UK sells to the rest of the world goes to Europe. That is indeed correct. Or that trade, investment and jobs and potentially lower prices benefit each household by about £3,000. That may well be correct as well. But what is somewhat unpleasant is the implication of the way how it is stated that all of these benefits would get lost after a Brexit. That of course is not true. The UK will continue to trade, perhaps less. The UK will continue to gain benefits from its relationship with Europe, but perhaps less. So what about the issue of control over laws? Now, I'm really no expert in this, but you have to ask the question, what will happen with that newfound control? And it's quite likely that industry will very quickly try to lobby that some of that new gained control is going to be used to negotiate an access or as close as possible a free access to the European single market again. And then you have to ask the question whether it's likely that the UK can get such an access without having to grant free movement of labour for European citizens or without having to follow some of the rules and regulations imposed by the European Union on the single market. Of course, it may be very attractive to have control over these decisions. 
So there are a number of things I haven't talked about, most notably immigration and whether that's positive and or not and even if it was positive whether you really want it or not and this is really a topic I will totally leave alone but I recognize that that is an important topic as is the issue whether the European Union has and will in the future contribute to a peaceful living together of different nations but here I concentrated on the economic issues without wanting to diminish the importance of these other issues when it comes to deciding on Brexit. 